Again, we appreciate the 60 years of faithfulness and dedication and leadership that Dr. Meredith has displayed. He's gone through many trials of fire and come through with golden character in leadership, and we really appreciate his leadership and his service, and we pray that he'll continue in that leadership until the return of Jesus Christ. We have a special presentation for him, and we have a particular Baccarat crystal Behind that, we have beveled glass, which has an inscription on it, and I'll just read the inscription. This uh, beautiful standalone beveled glass goes uh, behind it, if I don't break it. It's, uh... And it reads as follows, if I get this off. Reads as follows, Roderick C. Meredith, in grateful recognition of 60 years of servant leadership as an evangelist in God's church, restoring original Christianity around the world. And then under it, Isaiah 40, verse 31, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint, Isaiah 40, verse 31, from the Brethren of the Living Church of God. Well, thank you very, very much, Brethren. Thanks to Mr. Ames and all the others in this staff. Many people, I'm sure, had part in putting this together and I appreciate it, and as in my introductory notes, I was afraid Mr. Ames would look at my notes. Uh, actually, I wasn't afraid he couldn't read any of them. <laughs> but in my notes, I have, I have a, a note here to thank the whole uh, staff at the office. They gave me a very fine uh, golden clock. It wasn't all gold, I'm sure, but colored gold, and the clock is right on my desk. It sits at a very prominent place, very beautiful, so I appreciate that. And here we get these things that can also go in the office and very, a very fine thing. So I do thank all of you, and I want to thank all the ministry and the staff here who helped put this together, because I'm sure many had part in putting together this film. I didn't know this is part of the behind-the-work film, you know, we had two or three years ago. And so uh, thanks to Dylan Keith, uh, Dylan King, he somehow got some film uh, pictures from my wife of my childhood and you could see me as a little baby and then that fishing pole on the side of the hill some of you have heard me talk about my dad having a cabin down in the Ozark Mountains and that was when I was down there with with him fishing as a little boy and then uh, kind of interesting God has blessed me so much with the life I've been given for 82 and a half years now and they had the film there the picture of me sitting on a camel and David John Hill was a very colorful preacher and writer in the work in those years, and he and I went on that uh, trip together, and uh, so we got to ride camels a couple of times, and one of those right there was right below the Great Pyramid. And so it was very interesting to see those. Later it showed me in a rickshaw in Singapore. We were out in Singapore, and this man was running ahead of us, of course, in the rickshaws they have out there. Many, many wonderful experiences on that trip. But I am grateful for what God has given. So I hope you won't mind. I, I didn't know they're going to do all this again. They surprised me. Yesterday they gave a reception, and my son Jim is in charge of kind of remodeling there and fixing some nice editorial offices for Mr. Ames and the others in editorial in what used to be our big back room. And he said, we need to have you come back and look something. And I was right in the middle of finishing up a Bible study and something that might help me for this. And I said, well, have to wait a while. I thought he was going to show me some door or some fixture. 
And uh, then as he said, well, he acted kind of a little bit bugged. And I thought, well, I don't need to go back and see their fixture. After a few minutes, I came back to see the fixture, and the lights came on real quick, and everybody in the office was there. And it said, surprise, <laughs> that was the fixture. So they had a surprise party for me back there, which really was a surprise, and very, very grateful for that. So I don't want to talk too much about myself today, but you guys started it, and... Uh, <laughs> And uh, this, it is a special time, and I'm very grateful that God has given me uh, 63 years ago. I was baptized 63 years ago this month and ordained, of course, 60 years. I, I later felt guilty I was ordained just after three years, and yet I got to thinking, well, Jesus trained the apostles for three years, and then they were ordained apostles. So uh, that's what he did. It turned out that way. And I was ordained a, a, a one, a three years and a day, I guess it was, after I was, I was baptized. And then a few years later, I was in the ministry, but I wasn't ordained until I'd been full-time in the ministry, although I'd been on baptizing tours and writing articles and teaching Bible classes before that. But at any rate, I was ordained then in January, I mean, in December 20th, uh, 1952. And then, of course, our church started what we call the global and now living church of God, started, frankly, it was interesting how God brought me into the work in the ministry in December 52. And then exactly, you know, I didn't dream that that would ever happen. In no way I could have known. But exactly almost of the day, three years later, we had to start all over. And we started the global church of God, which now is the living church of God, in December and it wasn't at one time. And I want to give credit to many of the wonderful men and women who've helped me. I'd like to say, first of all, thanks to Mr. Marcus McCullough, the very beautiful special music, and I appreciate that. Marcus seemed to only make one big mistake. He never asked me to be a member of the choir, and I, I didn't get to sing. <laughs> I don't sing so good, so I'm kidding. But anyway, he does a great job, and we're glad to have him lead the choir. And... Uh, grateful for Mr. Munson giving a very fine sermonette. But I do want to thank the pioneers in this work. I do appreciate it. And the one who helped me at the very first and helped me the most of any human being is my wife, Cheryl. And you saw some beautiful pictures of her up here and made me feel pretty shabby. But uh, anyway, uh, she's far better looking than I am. I wish I had half of her looks, but she's had a terrible setback with her cancer, as you know. And now she's gained most of her weight back and beginning to look ravishingly beautiful again. Some of you young men don't realize how beautiful a 60-year-old woman could be. But anyway, she's a little past 60. But anyway, still beautiful. All of our wives are that way to us, I hope. And she's that way to me. So she helped me from the very beginning. And the other persons that helped me the most were at the very beginning right in the office were Mr. and Mrs. Don Davis. And I notice Mrs. Davis is here, and I want to comment on that. They were helping start the office. They were helping start the work, and I deeply appreciate it. And I'm kind of afraid. I hope all of you will send up a silent prayer. I don't think he's in a death-threatening situation, but Mr. Davis has this terrible virus that's going around. Some people have been down with it a week or 10 days, and he's 74 years old. I don't think he'd mind. Men don't usually mind knowing their age but uh, it can be harder on an older person. So he's had it very, very bad, or he would be here today, believe me. He hardly ever misses coming to work. So he's had to miss over the last week or 10 days coming to work and can't be here for this very special occasion. But he helped over and over in helping start the work right there in uh, San Dimas. We started at my house, actually, at first, in Glendora, California, and after a few weeks, why he found an office, a little uh, bungalow, brown bungalow, shingle office, not fancy at all, in uh, San Dimas, which is a little southeast of Glendora, so we could have several there to do the work together. And then later, we moved the work down to San Diego and a very beautiful place called the Courtyard, and then we moved back here because the Allen, the uh, landlord in the courtyard, kept raising the rent. And we looked for buildings we could buy out there, and the buildings that were like the building we have here all cost twice as much, almost exactly twice as much as we paid for our building. So we saved a pile of money by moving back here, and other expenses are less too. 
So we're very grateful we have more money to do the work, and we're closer to about 65 or 70 percent of our membership back here too, and we're closer to Europe and the Middle East. So God has brought us here, and I'm very grateful in a sense I'm coming home. Most of you are not just from, well, most of you probably are from North Carolina, but a lot of visitors, so it's really not my home, I know that, but I can claim it's sort of an ancestral home because my most famous relative was General Solomon Grant Meredith, and he was born in Greensboro and grew up for 19 years in Greensboro, North Carolina, and then he went out west as many young men in those, did in those days. They'd get more land for less money or have land given to them and he went out west, just him and a mule, when he was 19 years old and ended up being the surveyor general uh, of the uh, state and later became a brigadier general and later a major general in the war. But anyway, he's my most famous ancestor going right back to this state, Greensboro, North Carolina. So we're back home. <laughs> but all of us are looking for a much better home. I think you know that. In our home, we want a heavenly home. We want to, the plan that God has for us. So I thank Mr. and Mrs. Davis. I thank Mr. and Mrs. Davy Crockett, who helped start the church in Little Rock. I thank Dr. and Mrs. Fall, who helped start the church in Little Rock. The Davises and I started, of course, in, in Pasadena. And then my son Michael, who's not here, but I have to give him credit, he helped start the church in Atlanta, in Georgia. And later, one of the earliest full-time ministers to come with us, Mr. Sidney Hegbold, who'd been a teacher in Ambassador College, was also a preaching elder and pastored the churches in Ireland for several years. He then came with us very early on, one of the earliest full-time ministers, and he took over the church in Atlanta, which Mike, of course, was very happy for him to do because he was a full-time minister and Mike was brand new and had his own job and his own profession already. So we had a lot of people helping us start at the very beginning. I'm very grateful. I can't name them all, so please don't get your feelings hurt, otherwise I'd be naming almost every minister in the work, and I'm very grateful for every one. But among the pioneers who came early on were Mr. and Mrs. John O'Gwen. He brought with us the biggest church at the beginning, and two churches, Baton Rouge and Lafayette in Louisiana. And Mrs. O'Gwen is still here, and most of you know he was an absolutely outstanding minister and gave his life in the work of God. And then Mr. and Mrs. Carl McNair came soon after that. And they were extremely helpful. Then Carl McNair came in and immediately took over church administration, which I'd asked him to do. We were on the phone regularly. I knew he was coming, but he didn't want to come until his church was kind of ready to come with him. And he brought his church up in Montana. And then they came, and he immediately took over church administration and did a very fine job. And then Mr. soon after, Mr. and Mrs. D. Barra Partian, and Mrs. Apartin is here, I'm sure, today. So we're very grateful for what they did, and he immediately helped take over and really get the whole French work going. So I'm naming some of the main ones. I can't name everybody, among others who came, and I may not remember everybody anyway, but Mr. and Mrs. Gerald Weston came early on. I think it was late 1994, early 1995. And Mr. Weston then brought the very largest single congregation that has ever come with us, the one in Kansas City, which is about 200 people. So he did a very fine job and still is one of our most outstanding ministers. Mr. and Mrs. Rand Millich came with us early on. He and Gerald Weston were classmates, and they were very instrumental in helping in the church in a lot of ways in those early days. Mr. and Mrs. Dick Ames came then soon after that, and we were very grateful to have them. And I did not put Mr. Ames on the telecast immediately, but I planned to. And soon after I had settled in, we had him on the telecast, not because he was my brother-in-law, but because he already knew more about television than any of us and had a natural radio voice. He'd been a radio announcer in college, and, of course, he did very, very well on television and still is. Dr. Winnale came with us about that same time, and Mr. Bruce Tyler out in Australia came with us early on, and we're grateful for him about the same time and brought quite a number of people from Australia. And Mr. and Mrs. Wakefield came with us in Florida, I think, in early 19, 1995, and Mr. and Mrs. Fannin from over in Tennessee. So we had quite a number who came with us in those years in helping start the work when we were still very, very small. 
So I thank God for all of them and thank God that he's helped us carry on the work and carry on in this crusade. And our crusade is to revive the work of God because most of you older brethren know that some people came in. Paul talked about evil men coming in among you unawares and destroying the truth. And that's what happened in worldwide. And we had to come out, step out. And when my wife and I first stepped out, I told her, and I'm saying this before God, I better not be lying, but I told her a number of times. I said, honey, I'm not sure we'll have very many people follow us. I didn't know. I hope we would. I said, we might have 25 or we might have 50 or we might have 5,000. And I, are you willing to live in a trailer house? I didn't mean a great big fancy mobile home. I meant a trailer house. You know what I mean? That goes around in one room and so on. And she was glad to do that. And uh, we had to just trust God because we had no check, no income. And for two months or three months, whatever it was, those of us there in Pasadena had to just live off our savings and hope that God would help us get the work going. We had no promise. Other groups started later and got a whole bunch of people ready to go and say, wait, wait, something wonderful is going to happen while they were still being paid by Worldwide. We did not do that. We had to step out right away on faith to start the work of God. And so now we have, as Mr. Rod McNair was showing me the other day, our latest attendance figures for the Feast of Tabernacles a couple of months ago, when you count all the shut-ins and count, it was over 9,700. So we've come from our original attendance up in, up in my home in Glendora of 19 people Starting on the first Sabbath in, the, in 1993, we had our first unofficial service there in December 26, 1992. I mentioned that with 19 people. Then the next week, we had a, a, a little meeting hall and had 42 people. And that very autumn, we had 1,500 people at the feast. We had feast sites in Pigeon Forge over here in, in uh, Tennessee and then out in Del Mar, which is a suburb sort of, of of San Diego. The very next feast, we got up to 3,000 people, so we doubled. But then some of these other groups began to start, and then that cut back the rate of growth that we had. But we have grown, and we've had ups and downs. We've, we've had splits. But frankly, all the splits who split off from us have come to nothing. And I really mean that. I'm very grateful in a sense God has shown that he is with us, and we've had this blessing and I, they gave me some uh, information here Mr. McNair had put together in 1993, when, uh, uh, January, the radio broadcast, The World Ahead, began airing. And in July, I wrote, we now have over 1,220 households on the mailing list. And in addition, we have over 300 people who've responded to The World Ahead broadcast. We called it The World Ahead. And then when we had our disruption back in 98, we changed the title to Tomorrow's World. Then in May 1995, uh, we had the television broadcast, The World Ahead, begin airing. And in May, June 95, I wrote about 35 churches or video groups have been formed within the last nine weeks. About 885 new people began attending services. So we were growing, and we have other particular splits. At this time, brethren, today, the Living Church of God comprises... 352 congregations in 49 countries served by 203 ministers. Weekly worldwide attendance is averaging. Now, this is an average of 8,153. Of course, everyone doesn't come every Sabbath. I said when so many come at the Feast of Tabernacles, we had 9,700 and something. And we have uh, also... Uh, 3,720 people have been baptized through this work. Over 3,700, 9,701 kept the feast. 2,828,000 2, requests for literature have been generated through the time we've had our own program. And then that's over 2 million. Notice this, over 22 million households have viewed tomorrow's world television program and over 23 million literature items have been mailed out free of charge. So we're not a peanut stand. 
Yet compared to the world, we know we're still half a peanut shell of the Pacific Ocean. We don't want to brag or get the big head. We still have a long way to go, but at least we're grateful for what God has done thus far. And I'm sure all of you, we can be happy on this occasion. And I'm going to preach to all of you, but I hope some of you young people who are here, some of you in your early 20s and your teens, and you haven't proved all these things, and I hope that some of my things you can think about or write down and check up on us. God is real, and God is doing a work today, and this society is quickly coming to an end, and we are one of the very few works on the face of the earth, very few who are proclaiming the truth, and we're doing it with all of our hearts, and most of you know that. We're coming out stronger in certain ways than any other group on earth, and it's pretty obvious, and now most of you realize that. When the President of the United States comes out and he says he approves of men marrying men, and now they're saying out in California, I was just hearing on the news this morning, they're pushing through a bill, I don't know if it'll go through or not, where they're going to forbid these uh, groups that are trying to save the homosexuals to teach them not to do that. They're trying to say that's illegal. It's not right to try to homosexual from his bad ways. In effect, they're trying to say, you can't help cure drunkenness. You can't help cure homosexuality. You can't cure sin. Do you see what the world is getting into? They're getting about as far away from God as it is possible to get. And I know you young people have grown up in this time. I know you take it for granted because the sun is still shining. There are not riots out in the street. And you don't have a bunch of male prostitutes around beating on your door like Lot did. But we're getting there. We're getting there, fellas. And we're getting there, girls. We're getting to that kind of society. So let's understand. We are near the end of an age and our society is absolutely vile from the point of view of Almighty God. Everyone has not gone that far yet. But this work has got to be strong. And we've got to have courage to do this work and finish this work with all of our being. And we will have a reward forever if we do that. So I hope we can keep together, hang together, and do the work that God wants us to do because there's still an awful lot to do in this crusade to revive the work. I want to describe a scene that kind of like Star Wars, but far more important for you young people who've seen Star Wars. Way out in space, millions of years ago, two great, awesome beings were together. They were tremendous personality, was unlimited wisdom, and they've been working together now for millions of years. One of these great beings was called the Word, and he emptied himself to become a human being and came into this world to show us what God is like, to show us the way God is and the way God thinks. We know who he is. Most of you know by now, if you didn't already. His name was Jesus Christ. He'd been with God the Father from eternity. Turn with me to John chapter 1. As Mr. Armstrong said, this is the real beginning. This goes back even beyond Genesis 1, even earlier. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. You need to think about this. You young people, if you believe the Bible, just meditate on those words. Nothing was made apart from Christ. Christ made everything. He made your body. He made your mind. He made the very brains with which you think, the very brains that people pervert and try to say there is no creator, even of their brain. He created all the beautiful things in the world. He created the sun, the moon, the stars the tremendous overlapping interplay of all life and all creatures. The Creator did that, and He was the Word, and He was the personality who later became a human baby born of the Virgin Mary by a miracle from God. That Word became flesh. Verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, through Christ. 
and the world did not know him. He came into his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And the person's name in the Bible, of course, means their character, their personality, their office, everything about them. So that's Jesus Christ. Every now and then I read these religious articles where they're trying to find Jesus and they try to start with Jesus' birth as though he was just some Jew and they don't know who he was. They don't want to realize that he was the one that made everything. He was God with God the Father from eternity. They don't know that God. They don't know that Jesus. They're not called. We're not smarter than they are. I hope we all understand that. But they are not called, and we are. And as we see these prophetic things happening in the world today, as we've already seen the big things, and you young people have heard me tell about it, when I was growing up, I heard Mr. Armstrong say right after the Second World War, Germany would rise again, and Germany would be the leader in the coming union of Europe. We later heard him say in the 1960s and 70s that the Eastern European nations under the Soviet Union with hundreds of thousands of men and tanks there, they would break away. The Berlin Wall would come down. Germany, again, would become one nation, the two Germanys, East Germany and West Germany. It did. That's not some accident. He talked about the fact that these, these great sea gates would be taken away from our people, the peoples of Israel that God had given us, the Bab el Mandeb at the southern entrance to the Red Sea, the, the Suez Canal at the northern entrance, the Strait of Hormuz that Britain used to control. And now it's a terrible, dangerous situation because it controls so much of the flow of oil in the whole Middle East. And he mentioned, of course, Malacca Straits and Singapore, all those things, the Panama Canal that America controlled. He said many of these will be taken away. He never said all, but he said probably most of these will be taken away because God gave them because of Abraham's obedience and we're turning away. Well, now, brethren, they're all gone except two. All gone except two, the Gibraltar and the uh, uh, Falkland Islands controlling the tip around South Africa and the Argentinians are aggravating to get that back and the Spaniards are ag aggravating to get the Strait of Gibraltar and the Rock of Gibraltar back. They both may be gone. Then there will be none. These are not just accidental things where some crazy preacher talks about the end of the world like we had here recently. And no one, you know, just set some date or something out of thin air. These are major events affecting major nations that have happened, many of them in my lifetime, in my lifetime. And I've seen people healed over and over in my lifetime. I've often recited all those things to you. God is real. The God that we in this church serve is a very real God, and he's now beginning to intervene in human affairs and all you young people sitting here, please start to prove those things to yourself. Somewhere on this earth, there's a true God. There is a true work of God, the true church of God. And in the New Testament, it's called the church of God 12 different times. We are that church. That true church has always kept the Sabbath. That true church has kept the annual holy days. And that true church is called the church of God. So we're carrying on that work and we have to really understand it and appreciate what God is doing in that way. So I hope all of us can appreciate that and begin to prove these things to ourselves about the true church and everything. When I came to Ambassador College in September, early September 1949, I was terrained directly by Mr. Armstrong and I then saw many of these things happening. And I saw how God added so much of the truth to him that he didn't even have there. Mr. Armstrong was raised up by God as a very special instrument at this end time. And even though I'm carrying on, and frankly, my ministry has now been four and a half years longer than his ministry. Read it in his autobiography. He was ordained in June of 1931, and he died in January 1986. So I've had 60 full years where he just had, I guess, what was it, 55 and a half, something like that. Yet his ministry was much more powerful. His ministry was rich. He started from nothing. He didn't have a whole bunch of people out there who already knew about the truth. So we honor him. 
in all of this too. I wouldn't be here except for him, humanly speaking. You know, God could have used someone else, but Mr. Armstrong allowed himself to be used of God. So we're grateful for that. And we need to realize the meaning of these things. Back in uh, 1 Timothy, if you turn there with me, 1 Timothy, Mr. Armstrong was raised up to revive the church of God at the end of an age. And in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 14, we find here the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. We tried to incorporate our church as that, but a church, a little tiny church, nobody ever heard of it, they already had that incorporated, so we called ourselves not the church of the living God, we got as close as we could to it, living church of God. But that's one of the names of the church, the church of God at Corinth, the churches of God, the church of God here and there, and here is the church of the living God. And what is that church? The pillar, notice that, a pillar is a strong support. The pillar and ground, which is better translated bulwark. A bulwark is a whole array of earth or sand or something to help protect a fort so it's hard to get over that bulwark. We are that bulwark and that strong pillar to protect the truth. God gave us most of the truth through Mr. Armstrong and the Church of God coming down through the ages. The pillar and undergirding or, or bulwark of the truth. The Bible talks about the truth, the truth, the truth. Please never forget that, brethren. If someone tries to lead this church astray, and I don't think Satan will go after us the same way as he did in, world, in worldwide. I don't think that's going to happen. But remember, stay with the truth. I'm not asking you to stay with me. You know how often I've said on the program, don't just follow me. You follow what you prove in your own Bible. Follow the truth, the truth throughout the New Testament. In the early days of the church under Mr. Armstrong, back in 1949 to 53, 55, we didn't really have much of a church. When I came to college, we had three churches, Portland, about 20 people, Eugene, about 30 people, and Pasadena, 30 or 40, and then it grew because of the college. That was it. No other church. When I graduated three years later, we still only had three churches, and they weren't much bigger because Mr. Armstrong needed, of course, to train ministers to help him in the work, and then we began to grow as Raymond Cole and Herman Hay and Raymond Manera and I and others went out on baptizing tours, raised up churches and got things going, we did grow. But for those three years, we just sort of carried on to get the foundation laid and there weren't any new churches. So but we had the truth. And I've explained to people as we talked back then, we didn't say, when did you come into the church? We would say, when did you come into the truth? That was the term we used back then over and over. So we are the continuation of the church of God, but it's certainly the pillar and bulwark of the truth. And we want to stay with that truth with all of our hearts, and I'm sure you know that we will. Some people try to accuse me of jumping the track. Well, I have all kinds of human faults. I'm impatient. I'm pushy. I slam the door and kick the cat. We don't have a cat, so I'm kidding, but you know what I mean. I have human nature like anyone else. But brethren, if I can say this, not bragging, but just so any of you who are new understand, I, I'm not liable to jump off the track. I've been on the track for 63 years. No one's ever accused me of had any understanding of leaving the truth. God has used me to teach more Ambassador College Bible classes than any other human being. I can prove that. Somehow, maybe that's all an accident, but I think God had a reason for that. But I'm not, not about to jump, jump the truth. Mr. Ames has stuck with the truth for 35 or 45 years. And Dr. Nail the same. And most of the rest of us, Mr. Weston, for many decades. So our men are not some brand new men. Frankly, the Tocaches and some others that came out of nowhere and changed everything, they hadn't had all that testing. But we want to stay with the truth. But I think you can have the confidence that most of us who've been around for decade after decade after decade teaching the truth are not very liable to jump the truth at this point in our lives. So I hope you can figure that out. We may have other human mistakes. But we are to be the pillar and undergirding of the truth, and that is so important. 
Mr. Armstrong, how did he learn the truth? He learned the truth at first by his wife explaining to him what she read in his own autobiography about the Sabbath day. And then he was willing, after fighting that at first, to prove, yes, you really need to keep the Sabbath. But then he went beyond what she explained and what the Sardis people had and proved the annual holy days. He proved all kinds of things they never had. They were nice country people. Their churches were not growing. I've attended Sardis Sabbath services. I don't know what I could say, 10 or 20 times. Mr. Armstrong had Ken Herman and Owen Smith and I attend the Sardis Church up there in the summer of 1950 because we were working in the woods in Oregon and we did have a local church there close by. So he said, you fellows attend the church in in, uh, Jefferson, Oregon, which is a Sardis church as we call it today. He kind of chuckled. He said, I raised up that church. And he said, they still have most of the truth. But he said, they don't grow. They just keep the same. And he said, you won't bother them. But he said, uh, he said, they won't bother you, but you may bother them. And I realized that then when Ken Herman and Rod Meredith, very impressive young men, 19 years old and 21, we walked in, these older men look, oh, Armstrong's men are here to take over. <laughs> kind of amusing. Look, we were just kids. They were afraid already. They'd heard of Mr. Armstrong. We were just there to worship. And after we'd been there a few weeks, they settled down and and understood we were just there to worship and so on. But I've been in those churches and here in a couple of them in Oregon. I've been in the one in Joplin, Missouri, where we I would meet sometimes with my wife when we had no church there yet. I had certain reasons to go there because my mother was not converted. In order to really keep the Sabbath, it was better that I had a chance to worship with those who did believe. And I frightened them there too because the local minister was all concerned. Brother Burge, I think his name was, big fat guy, and his, his, anyway, I better not describe that more. But he was kind of hustling around and he was trying to keep his way, his people away from me because when I got there, I found out that dozens of those people, there weren't that many dozens, but we had 35 or 40, they had already read my articles in the plain truth. And I don't think the Sardis ministers liked that. They were reading the Plain Truth magazine, uh, even in that little church and a little old rock building up over the hill above the Joplin stockyards. But uh, he was worried that I'd come to take over his church. And, of course, I hadn't had any idea like that. Anyway, Mr. Armstrong learned the truth through his wife and through the Bible. But, brethren, there was the church of God because the Sardis people did understand about the Sabbath They knew about the holy days, and he learned about it through their literature. They weren't keeping them. They would keep some of them, but not all of them. And even the Passover, they would keep with grape juice at the wrong day. But he learned the idea of the holy days, and then he studied and proved the whole thing and the meaning of the holy days, which they did not know. They understood the truth about the the, the gospel of the kingdom, that the kingdom was to be on the earth and not up in heaven. And they knew about clean and unclean meats and a number of other things. But he went way beyond them and God used Herbert W. Armstrong to add the knowledge of the holy days and the real meaning of the holy days, which is absolutely wonderful. And brethren, as you older brethren can understand this even better, when you think about all your relatives who've died and the people in the Lusitania and the Titanic who went down, you know, on these terrible shipwrecks, hundreds of them, were they all bad? No. What's going to happen to them? Well, the Protestants can't understand that. The Catholics can't explain that. Only those of us who understand the meaning of the last great day understand that. That is a magnificent truth. And the whole plan of the Holy Days was added by Mr. Armstrong in the Church of God. Also, the truth of Israel. The fact that we people in America and the British descended peoples are the descendants of the so-called lost tribe of Israel. That's a magnificent truth. That is the key to understand about 90% of end time prophecy. It really is. And Mr. Armstrong was the one that uh, he came in touch with those who understood it, the British Israel people, but they didn't understand the Sabbath, the Holy Days. They just had that one thing, and they had a lot of garbage connected up with it about so many pyramid inches and other things that didn't really have anything to do with anything were wrong. He sorted all that out and made the truth of it come out. 
He did all that. So we do understand prophets as a church better than any peoples on the earth by far. We can know who we are and what's happening to the descendants of Israel. He was able to understand not the immortal soul, but the spirit in man in a way that we never had done before. And I was sitting in the graduate school when he went through that. He would talk and think out loud and just did that right before our eyes. And then right in the spring of 1953, he came to understand the whole ultimate purpose of human existence, that God is, in fact, wanting us to be full sons. He wanted us to become full sons of God, born of God, in the kingdom of God, the family God, of the God level. And people had never understood that before. Certainly even the church of God had never understood that before. Mr. Armstrong did come to understand that and we are grateful for that. God used him to put those things together for us, and we can be very, very grateful. Back in John chapter 6, brethren, turn there with me at this point, if you would, to the Gospel of John, and I'm going to begin reading here in chapter 6 of the Gospel of John, and I want to, uh, went to John 1 earlier, but this is chapter 6. Here we understand more about this final thing that God is working with. He says in verse 53, Then Jesus said to his disciples, John 6, 53, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Does that mean you have an immortal soul? No, just keep on reading. Has eternal life, and I will raise him up. You see, you read the whole verse. I will raise him up at the last day. So you have this, the presence of eternal life within you, but then you do die at the end of this life, and God will raise us up at the last day if we have Christ living in us. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. And here's the key, I in him. Christ must live his life within us. And I've dwelt on that so much, but I wanted to just give you some big basics here in this overall sermon with so many coming in and new people, young people, we need to really go back and appreciate what God has given us. Christ lives his life in us, and that's the only way we'll be given eternal life. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. How do you feed on Christ? You feed on this book. This is Christ in print. You study the Bible. You do, then you think like Christ thinks. You have the mind of God and you understand the ways of God, the Spirit of God, everything about God through this book in detail. Here it is. Please don't let the distractions of this world, and again, you young people, please don't get the television habit. Please don't get the Internet habit where you start, you've got to check in here and check and check your email and check this and check that. They say we've got lots of information out there. But what's the information about? Most of it's about nothing, nothing of any worth. Just people passing on their human ideas. And Joanne went over here and we had a trip or we had a fishing trip or you read about some latest movie or some, some athletic team beat some other team. Well, that's okay once in a while as a diversion. But if we have our minds centered on achieving the purpose of our lives and we drink into this word and we feed on God in a remarkable way, there is nothing import more important than that, brethren. Nothing more important. Wow, can we have blessings if we do that. Down in verse 63, he said this. In verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit. These words are spirit, and they are life. So you have to really think on that, meditate on it. It's a very powerful thought how the very spirit of God, the nature of God is revealed in these pages when you read the Bible in that way. 
God help all of us to heed, for God must truly live his life within us. I don't have it in my notes, but I have to say it, I guess, each, each sermon, <laughs> my favorite verse, you know, Galatians 2.20, where the Apostle Paul was inspired to say, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live with the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the key. Christ must live his life in you. And these words are spirit and they are life. And through these words living within you, then God himself begins to live within you. Then God is working with you, fashioning you, molding you, and preparing you, every one of you, to be full sons of God to bear the very name of God for all eternity in the spirit family of God. In a few years, we won't be male and female. In a few years, we won't be black or white or yellow or red or anything else. In a few years, we won't be old or young or fat or skinny. And I won't have my glasses. I can throw my hearing aids away. <laughs> All those things that we're handicapped with in this life, we'll have none of that. We'll have a spirit body in God's very family, and it will be awesome. And we really need to look forward to that so much we can taste it and put that way ahead of everything else and everything we think, say, and do. So I hope we can get that picture and be willing to go all out for what really counts. First Peter three or 4, verse 16. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Brethren, as this work grows in power, and as I get stronger, as Mr. Ames gets stronger, and all of us on the television get stronger and stronger and stronger about preaching the truth, and this world gets further away from it, and many of our local ministers, some of our local ministers are here today from the nearby churches, you've got to get stronger too. We will get persecuted in a way we've never been persecuted before. I used to think we'd get persecuted pretty regularly, and somehow we just didn't. I had rocks thrown at me and guns pointed at me a few times, but none ever pulled the trigger, and I was never really seriously injured. I pictured that Herman Hay and I and Raymond McNair and others of us would go out on tours and we'd get beat up or thrown in jail and things like that, helping Mr. Armstrong get out the message. It never happened. God never allowed it to happen thus far. And yet your Bible says what it means and means what it says. I don't want any of you out there, Mr. I can't remember everything Mr. Uh, Sheldon Munson said, but he was talking about courage. We're all going to need courage in the years ahead. We really are, just like he exemplified there through the mighty men of David. So he said, if you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, don't let that happen. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God. For the time has come that judgment is to begin in the house of God. And if it begin with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? That terrible persecution is going to come on us. God says it. It will happen. Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved... Am I going to be saved with a great big margin of extra goodness? No. What am I worthy of? I know what I'm worthy of. I'm worthy of death. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If we get what we deserve, we're all dead. <laughs> you know, Not fun to think about it, but that's the truth. If we get what God gives us through his mercy, through the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus Christ, then we can be forgiven. And certainly we want to live a good life through Christ in us. And if we do that and do extra part in the work of God, then that doesn't save us, but that will give us an extra measure of reward in God's kingdom. Maybe rather than just being a doorkeeper, we can be over a city or five cities or ten cities or someday maybe a whole planet or someday maybe a whole galaxy. You know, well, you've heard us explain that. Of the increase of his kingdom, there is no end. So we do want to go all out. There will be rewards. There will be blessings for that. But we're not saved by that. We must never get the big head. All of us have sinned. Judgment must begin at the house of God. 
And if it is begin with us first, what's going to be the end of those who don't really go all out? If the righteous one is scarcely saved, we're scarcely saved, when will the ungodly and sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. All of you are here because of that, and I'm grateful. And I'm grateful so many of you now, as we look around, we do have quite a number of people in their 20s and 30s and even down into their teens and younger people coming. Really inspiring once in a while in our local service. We only have about 240 or 50 people, but the other day I was watching, it seemed like it was 20 or 30 kids from whatever it was, four to nine or something coming by, and uh, Mrs. Lucky Lyons is leading them in the, toward the children's Bible class. whole bunch of them, just, you know, kid after kid after kid, so we're getting some. <laughs> some of our young couples are becoming very fruitful. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> that was God's first command. You know, a lot of old-fashioned Protestants are ashamed of sex, and they try, oh, well, we've got no safe thing about that. That's evil. No, it isn't. We've got to be sure that we have the right understanding of it. But the first command, the very first command, actually, that is listed to mankind was be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. <laughs> That's what God said. So he made us male and female. He wants us to have happy families. He wants us to have love and joy in our homes. He wants romance. He wants little children. He doesn't want women to be off working all the time and be career woman, women. He wants people to be family people. He doesn't want these men nowadays that are going off by the tens of thousands to become homosexuals, to think they can love each other in a perverted manner that God never, ever intended. And they can't reproduce. They can't do what God said. The whole thing perverts their thinking, their mind, from the purpose of human existence when they do that. That is damnable. And God's going to stop it. God wanted us to love each other as men and women. He wanted us to have families. He wanted us to have little children. But we've got to be willing to go all out for the kingdom of God to help reach this world while there's time, and we will be persecuted. Be sure, brethren, I don't care what the persecution is, be sure that you never, never, ever turn aside. Be a spiritual warrior, as Mr. Munson was describing. Be like David's mighty men where you're fighting so hard that the sword clings to your hand and you can't even give it up, so to speak. You young men, you can be warriors for Jesus Christ. And all of us, spiritually speaking, can be warriors for Jesus Christ. And we should be and think about it in that way. Now I want to turn back to John 14, go back to the Gospel of John again, and I'm going now to John chapter 14 this time, and I want you to begin reading here in verse 1. Here is a scripture that the world often perverts because they use this, of course, in funeral sermons and misread it. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and the word can't be translated offices or positions. And if you check the Father's house, look back in John, the same book inspired by the same God. John chapter 2, verse 6, Jesus said, You make my Father's house a house of merchandise. And he drove them out of the temple. The temple was God's house. And in God's temple were different particular offices to designate the job, high priest or some other responsibility they had. God is preparing offices for us today. God is preparing, God, Christ is, jobs for us today in God's kingdom, in God's house. And if I go and prepare a place, a position, a responsibility, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. And where I go you know and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, here's old doubting Thomas, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And brethren, as you feed on Christ, as you drink in of Christ's life in this book, and you see how Christ did all day long, what day did Christ keep? He kept the Sabbath day, the same the Jews were all keeping. What annual festivals? Did he keep Christmas like the pagans are going to keep in a couple of days? No, he always kept God's holy days. 
Did Christ go to war and fight? No, he did not. Did Christ vote and get in world politics? No. Did Christ become a homosexual? No. He constantly taught about marriage. He didn't marry himself for two reasons. First, he was going to die at age 33, which he already knew. And secondly, spiritually speaking, he was already married to ancient Israel. And that was important to me. Not seem important to you, but that analogy was there, and he understood that. So he was God. He had a special mission. But most of the disciples were married, as you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Peter and James and John and Bartholomew, no doubt doubting Thomas, all of them were married. They were married men. Paul said, if I and Barnabas only don't have a wife like these others do, indicating the vast majority of them were married men. And so God wants us to be married. And Christ set as the example, but that's the main thing that we have to understand. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Feed on that. Imagine this great being in outer space coming into this human flesh. My son Jim and his wife Susan were over in Israel recently to help line up the feast over there next year and go to these various sites. And he was walking where Jesus walked. And I've got to do that on three trips to Israel over the years. And it means a lot sometimes when you think about it, take your Bible along. Christ was right here. He was among us. He set us the example, not just an example, the example. We want to feed on that and say we are going to have that Jesus Christ of the Bible live his life within us and go all out to do that. So I hope all of us can get that picture and think about it and be true Christians with Christ living within us. Back in John 17... One of my favorite chapters in all the Bible, as I've told you many times, here's Jesus' last prayer, his final full prayer, and the only full prayer mentioned, in fact, of Christ in the Bible. He said in John 17, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you've given him. And this is eternal life. Brethren, I used to read over this even when I was teaching the freshman Bible class, and it didn't, the depth of it didn't dawn on me until later. But think about it. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Back in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3 and verse 4, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. How do you really know God? You know God by letting him live his life in you through the Holy Spirit, keeping his commandments, experiencing through the Holy Spirit within you, experiencing through Christ within you what God is like. You have the life of God, the life of God in you by Christ living in you through the Spirit. This is eternal life. We start that process. We put our hand in Christ's hands and we walk right on over into a new dimension, into the family of God. This is eternal life, that they may know you, that we walk and talk and commune with Christ. We have him living within us. He's real to us. We see how he delivers us here, delivers us there, heals us there, blesses us there. He intervenes powerfully in human affairs. He becomes very real, very real to us. Christ has become far more real to me in the last five or ten years than when I was younger even though I was teaching Bible classes and doing things, as you grow, that becomes more real than it should be. As they know you, the only true God of Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So we've got to really come to know God as our Father. We've got to come to know as a personal friend, our elder brother, our Savior, our active high priest, Jesus Christ. Know him, walk with him, talk with him, commune with him, interact with him as you see him help you here and help you there. Not imagine yourself, not be sentimental and act and pretend things that happen, but there will be real things that will happen that cannot be denied. When I saw my friend Dick Armstrong had prayed for Howard Clark, as I said, I've seen Howard for years sitting in his wheelchair over in the right hand of the meeting place. He'd been, he said, oh, well, she should have gone to the doctor. Doctor, He'd been to dozens of doctors in the top naval hospitals all over the country. They'd spent thousands of dollars on him. They couldn't do anything. He had shrapnel wounds from the Korean War. 
He was a quadriplegic. Dick prayed for him. Pentecost, 1958. Bang! He's completely healed by Almighty God. That brought tears to my eyes when I came and saw him in person and talked to him after that. It was so real, someone I had known. In fact, as a matter, I, I honestly, I, I had baptized him. So I did know him, and he'd been one of my friends and so on. But anyway, God does those things. And as God does those things, and you know and you know those things, God becomes real, and he should become real to each one of you. This is eternal life. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. He was with the Father at the beginning. As I've said, he said, let there be light. That was Christ's voice. That was not the Father's voice. He was the Word. He said that. Let there be light throughout the universe, and there was light. He was that great God. So he was the one, and he wanted that same glory back again. So his face would once again shine in full strength. He said then and down here in verse 20, at the end of this prayer, he said, I don't pray just for these disciples. I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And that's us. We are not with Christ in person and in flesh, but we believe through these words in the Bible. He was praying for us when you think about it. And the glory which you have, and I said, and I'm sorry, I don't want to go back and pick this up, that they all may be one in, in, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me, I have given them. That's the key verse, if you think about it, verse 22. The glory, what was that glory? The one who said, let there be light. The one who had total magnificence. The glory you gave me, I have given them, that they, that's us, brethren, that they may be one just as we are one. Our glory, our future, our calling is magnificent when you think about it. It really is hard to fully imagine what God has in mind. That's why he wants us to live by every word of God. That's why Christ said you're to feed on him, to feed on Christ, to walk with Christ in a profound way so that God can fully form his character in you and then you can live forever. Back in Revelation chapter 3, turn back there with me. I'll go a few minutes over. Mr. Ames told me again and again here <laughs> and others because we had a lot of extra stuff with the presentation, the film, and so on, so you won't mind. Back in Revelation 3, the, to the church of the angel of Sardis write, and then we find described here this church. He says, he says I, have, uh, I know your work, that you have a name, that you're alive, but you're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. When I attended the Sardis church several times, I found some nice people, but they were not growing. They had no concept of the work. They'd sit around after church and say, Well, George, he says, How, how's the crops? And how's the weather? And how that's all they could talk about, just the local community. They were not reading world news. They were not aware of what was happening even then in Europe. They were not aware of the prophetic things that were about to happen and going to happen. They didn't have that picture. So they have had that sort of a countryfied, backward attitude. And God is letting some of them have robes in white and be in his kingdom finally. But they didn't do much. And so he said in verse 7, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. That's the next to the last era. And brethren, that's the era I think you all know. And you young people, if you haven't heard this, look it over, study it. That's the era we're carrying on, the spirit of Philadelphia. Most of the people of God at the end of this age are certainly destined to be Laodicean. That means they have the truth. God never condemns them for not knowing the truth, but they're lukewarm. They're lethargic. They're self-satisfied. They're not urgent to get the message out. We're still carrying on that zeal that came through Herbert W. Armstrong and the era that some of us who are older lived through and helped build. 
because we work right with him. And I don't mean to be bragging. That was my life. I had part in it. That was my life from age 19 on to help build that work with Mr. Armstrong. So I give him full credit as the leader. But we were in it, several of us, and we're still here. So he said to us, these things says he who is holy, he is true. He who has the key of David. And as I've given you a whole sermon on that a few days, days, weeks ago, years ago, that has to do with government. David was the basic ruler that God keeps referring to over and over again. You were not like your father David, therefore you're bad. You were like your father David or are like your father David. He was say to the good kings and over and over David is used as the benchmark. He will be the chief king over all of Israel. The 12 apostles will be under King David over individual tribes. So the key of David is that right knowledge of church government which we have. I know your works, he says, and I've said before you an open door and no man can shut it. Some people in these little scattered groups, you, some of you know them, you have friends who say, the work is over, the work is over. Well, how then could Mr. McNair come up, and I'm sure he's checked all this, since we began the Global Living Church of God, 3,720 brand new brethren have been baptized. Over 3,000 human beings. It's not as many as we'd like, but we're very grateful for that. We're reaching out 20 or 30 million human beings here, our program, as you've seen. And it's growing, it's growing, it's growing. God has brought in Mr. Wyatt Seselka to help get the Internet really growing in a way it never did before. And it is growing now. I won't try to go through that, but we're very grateful for that. We're very grateful for the new stations that we're on in television. And we're grateful for every aspect of God's Word. So he says, I've set before you an open door. And every time the Bible uses the term door in that way, it's showing, of course, as you know, the way to get the message out. No one can shut it. No, they can't. We can be kicked off an individual station, but not the door of television, not the door of radio, not the chance to preach the gospel. No man can shut it, for you have a little strength. Yes, we're still terribly small, but we are doing an increasingly powerful work around the world. And you have kept my word. As I told you at the beginning of the sermon, brethren, it's not just that we're the church of God. We have what? The truth, the truth, the truth. Fight for it. Die for it. The truth. You have my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews, that they're spiritual Jews and are not but are liars, indeed, I will make them to come and know your name that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. And brethren, many of you older people, most of you no doubt who are here who are older have had to persevere. Many of you, let me just ask your hands, how many of you were in Worldwide at one time or the other? Just raise your hands. Wow, I can't even start. Mr. Ames would probably say it's not 89 and 7 tenths percent. But anyway, <laughs> it's, it's most everybody here. About 90%. So you have persevered. Thank God for you. You have persevered and kept on in spite of trials and tests. Keep it up. You young people, I saw you saw these hands. You'll have your trials and tests. Don't give up. If you prove the truth, and I challenge you to do that, these big things that I've talked about, there is a work of God at the end of an age, and this is that work, and we're doing that work and don't ever leave it, don't ever give up on it. So he tells us, you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world. What time would that be? Well, I think we all know. The great tribulation. One man that left us a number of years ago, as a little church out in the northwest, he thinks the great tribulation is going to be some persecution on the little state of Israel. That's ridiculous. It's on the whole world. It's the great tribulation that's coming on America, Britain, and all the western world. The great tribulation. And, of course, it's a huge thing that's going to happen. So he'll keep you from the hour of trial that will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast, that no man may take your crown. 
Please do that, brethren. Most of you have a crown, in a sense, it's indicated already. Your name is already written in the book of life. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Don't get bitter about some little imagined offense or some real offense. I've had a number of real offenses where I knew that the people were wrong in what they were doing. I just had to somehow forget it and go on. Many of you have done that or you wouldn't be here, I know. Keep it up. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep it up for on and on and on. God wants us to do that. Anyway, he tells us here then, my Bible flipped here on me. Now let's go on to the next verse. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Verse 11. So Christ is coming quickly on this era. Hold fast that you have, that no one take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. You are called to be pillars. And many of you young people, if you can really get behind the youth program and hear and understand Mr. Sheldon Munson's sermonette, be strong, be courageous. You can be a pillar yourself among the other young people. And later on, as some of us older ones maybe have to be retired or die or whatever, we must not be afraid of that word. It's appointed to all men wants to die. You may be the leaders to carry on. Be sure you do that. Have vision and have courage and drive yourself toward the most important goal in human history, the very goal of the purpose for which God has given all of us life and breath to become full sons of God. So he said, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. And I will write upon him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we are now lapsed over into the Laodicean era. And most of those in what is called the greater church of God are Laodicean. Many of you know that. You see that by their fruits. They don't have the passion. They don't have the fire to really get close to God. They don't have the fire to do the work. But many of us do not have that as we ought either. Some of us let down from day to day or month to month. I have to fight my human nature every hour that I live. And you do too. So even those of us, many of us in the living church of God are not on fire to the degree we could be. And I challenge you to get on fire. Think about what is really important. Understand as you see this country going down, as you see these homosexuals take over, as you see the Muslims take over, as you see the liberals take over, as you see Satan the devil take over this country and this whole society more and more, be inspired by it. He is coming. He is coming soon. We've got to get his message out. We've got to be his servants. We've got to be his bond slaves. We've got to be the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. You have that opportunity. You've been called to do that. So I hope that you and I can all work together as the team in this final crusade to get Christ's message to the world in a powerful way, in a way that's never been done yet in modern times. Not that we're better than Mr. Armstrong, but he'll give us extra power at the end. We know that perhaps the gifts of the Holy Spirit, other things, big things happening in the world to shake people to be willing to listen. Let's do it. And we will have the kind of reward as full members of the sons of God in the city of God and God's family interacting with Christ, interacting with the spirits of just men made perfect forever. It's worth it. All the tears, all the sicknesses, all the trials and tests and upsets and misunderstandings that all seem like nothing once we are full members of the family of God. So let's go that way together, brethren, in this crusade. Let's persevere. Let's never give up.